Hi, my name is Rich Savell. I am the director of the Surgical Intensive Care Unit here at Maimonides Medical Center, and this is the introductory educational video for house officers rotating here in the surgical ICU. In this video, we're going to help you understand the basics of the different categories of shock states. I'm going to talk about the differential diagnosis of when a patient is having cardiopulmonary arrest. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the three-hour and six-hour bundles for patients with severe sepsis syndrome. Importantly, I want to take some time and try to help you understand how an intensivist thinks about acid-base disorders and how we take a structured approach to patients with this problem. Finally, over here, I'm going to take a few minutes and speak to you about how we define ARDS and how we use the ARDSnet protocol as a standardized approach to managing patients who have the acute respiratory distress syndrome. We will take a few minutes and talk about the abdominal compartment syndrome. And then at the very end, we will talk about the ventilator bundle and the catheter-related bloodstream infection bundle. In terms of differential diagnosis of shock, there are some important categories that you need to keep in mind when you're caring for the critically ill patient. As you can see here, hypovolemic, distributive, cardiogenic, and non-cardiogenic obstructive. Primarily, you will be caring for patients who have septic shock while you're here in the surgical intensive care unit. Surgical septic shock, septic shock, is a subcategory of distributive shock. Other examples of distributive shock include spinal shock and anaphylactic shock. Hypovolemic shock is commonly seen in patients who are bleeding, hemorrhagic shock, but also in patients who have diabetic ketoacidosis. Cardiogenic shock is important, but not primarily something you'll see while you're here in the surgical intensive care unit, where the primary problem is pump dysfunction. This is a very important category because it can be known, or used to be known, as cryptogenic shock, non-cardiogenic obstructive. It's as though there is pump failure, but fundamentally the heart is working fine. Examples include pericardial tamponade, pulmonary embolism, tension pneumothorax, and importantly, especially in this intensive care unit, the abdominal compartment syndrome. It's very important that you keep these in mind when you're caring for a patient who's meeting criteria for shock. Here is an important differential diagnosis that's important when you're caring for a patient who requires CPR. Why am I coding? It's important that the person who's running the code explicitly go over these items during the code. Does the patient have hypovolemia, hypoxia, hypothermia, hypo or hyperkalemia, massive MI, pericardial tamponade, pulmonary embolism, tension pneumothorax, overdose, or acidosis? These are important, especially when you're actively running a code to think about these things that might be treatable. Excitingly, here is a description of the three hour and six hour bundles for the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines, or as you can see here, Surviving Sepsis, for reasons I still don't understand. At three hours, it, you are expected for a patient who meets criteria for severe sepsis syndrome, and we've talked a lot about this, infection in two or more, uh, two or more SERS criteria is sepsis, sepsis with acute sepsis-induced organ dysfunction is severe sepsis syndrome, and if the patient remains volume uh, remains vasopressor dependent after appropriate volume resuscitation, the patient meets criteria for septic shock. What you're supposed to do in that setting, and we have a sepsis order set, and we will be discussing that, but type in sepsis into Sunrise Clinical Manager and it will pop up. You check a lactate by three hours, check a lactate level, get cultures prior to antibiotics, start broad-spectrum antibiotics, and there are antibiotics that are pre-done for you in the order set that are appropriate, and give at least a 30 ml per kilo crystalloid bolus initially. At six hours, you should have the patient on vasopressors if they remain persistently hypotensive with a mean arterial pressure target of greater than 65 millimeters of mercury. You should be considering if a central line hasn't already been placed, place one, and if you have placed one, check a central venous pressure the targets of those are going to be between 8 and 10, or 8 to 12. And remeasure lactate if your initial serum lactate is elevated. It's now on acid-base status in the intensive care unit. It's very important to have a fundamental understanding of this so that you can deal with it. 
This is not something that I'm doing for academic purposes. It's really important. We use this to make real life decisions in the intensive care unit. As intensivists, we break things down into metabolic acidosis and metabolic alkalosis. First, we'll start with metabolic acidosis. You have to calculate the anion gap, and if the anion gap is elevated, the differential diagnosis, as you can see here, is mud piles, and we'll go over that. Methanol, uremia, diabetic ketoacidosis, peraldehyde, iron or INH, lactate, ethylene glycol, and if you want to get fancy, salicylate toxicity with a metabolic acidosis and a respiratory alkalosis. The most important here is obviously in this unit, on this rotation, is an elevated serum lactate from patients who have some form of shock. Most of the time, it's severe sepsis syndrome and septic shock. The idea here is the reason we check this is because we consider this to be a cosmetic metabolic acidosis, and it isn't about treating the fundamental uh, it isn't about treating the acidosis, but figuring out why the patient is acidotic and treating The next them. part of metabolic acidosis is a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. The way I would like you to think about that is to remember that the patient is either losing, is either losing bicarb from their gut or their kidney or has been resuscitated with a bicarb-poor substance like normal saline. When I say they're losing bicarb from their gut, usually that's in the form of diarrhea and when I say they're losing it from their kidney, they're, what I'm referring to here is a renal tubular acidosis. Now, this can be intimidating. Don't let it intimidate you. Let it wash all over you. This is important. So there's type 1, 2, and 4. 1 is distal, 2 is proximal, where the body is not reabsorbing bicarb. And then, importantly and excitingly, the type 4 RTA. And it has taken me years to be able to get my mind around this enough to teach it to you. So a type 4 RTA is a form of hypoaldosteronism. It's an equal sign. Type 4 RTA is hypoaldosteronism. And so then the question is, is it primary hypoaldosteronism? Does the patient have adrenal insufficiency from sepsis? Or does this patient have some form of drug-induced hypoaldosteronism? And this is actually really important because you, that's right, you, when you're on call, you will be called with a patient who has an elevated potassium and a normal creatinine. And you should think that patient has a type 4 RTA due to a drug, most likely. And the common drugs, as we've talked about a lot here on this rotation, include ACE inhibitors, NSAIDs, and surprisingly and importantly, heparin. So heparin-induced hypoaldosteronism is an important cause of hyperkalemia that is otherwise of unclear etiology in the intensive care unit. The next thing to talk about is the differential diagnosis of a metabolic alkalosis. Metabolic alkalosis is a little bit more confusing, and it is clearly the unsung hero of acid-base disorders in the critically ill patient. But it's important. I'll give you an example. A patient with COPD comes in with a CHF exacerbation. Already my mind's worrying. COPD or with a CHF exacerbation. So a COPD or somebody with a chronic respiratory acidosis with metabolic compensation, then they come in with a CHF exacerbation and they need to be diuresed, which makes their serum bicarb go up even more. And their response to that is to retain even more CO2. So you can see that an understanding of acid-base disorders can be the difference between life and death for a patient with something as simple as COPD and CHF. So let's take a look here at how you work up or think about somebody with metabolic alkalosis. You're supposed to send off a spot urine chloride and look if it's less than 20 or less than 25 or greater than 40. This breaks these entities down into chloride responsive and non-chloride responsive metabolic alkalosis. One of the most important ones commonly is, especially in a surgical intensive care unit, is vomiting or NG tube suctioning. This is very common, it makes sense, you're sucking out acid, the patient develops an alkalosis. One of the important points I want to, to point out to you that you need to remember is the relationship between hypokalemia and a metabolic alkalosis. They feed off of each other and are tightly linked to each other and that you often can't get rid of your metabolic alkalosis until the patient's potassium and magnesium have been appropriately uh, supplemented. The treatment for a chloride-responsive metabolic alkalosis is to give saline. 
Okay, that makes sense. But here's where it gets complicated. If your urine chloride is greater than 40, you have a constellation of diagnoses where I try to keep it all together by thinking of the fact that you have revved up the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. So hyperaldosteronism, pseudo-hyperaldosteronism, which is called Liddell syndrome, um, actively using a diuretic. So again, uh, that can be seen and it makes sense why the urine chloride would be elevated. In addition, there are two entities, Barter's and Gittleman's syndrome, which are these channelopathies where the body is acting like it has its own diuresis, and it's very much uh, analogous to actively using diuretics. Licorice is important and interesting because it has to do with the mineral acorticoid receptor, and the there's a molecule in licorice, glycerinic acid, that inhibits 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase and allows the mineral acorticoid receptor to be constitutively firing, again, causing an elevated cortisol, uh, an elevated steroid state. Um, other examples include ex exogenous steroids and ectopic ACTH. So again, you break it down into chloride-responsive and non-chloride-responsive metabolic alkalosis, I think the important things to keep in mind, big picture, when you're thinking about acid base is, does this patient have an anion gap or a non-ion gap metabolic acidosis or both? Does this patient, if they have a non-anion gap, do they meet criteria for a type 4 RTA in terms of hypoaldosteronism? And I hope you've seen the nice yin and yang of hypoaldosteronism and hyperkalemia and hyperaldosteronism and hypokalemia. This is not something trivial, it's very important. So try to keep all this in mind when you're thinking about your critically ill patient.